we go. Yes, thank you for the introduction. And um, well, you already heard what this is about, but maybe you have some ideas that are not quite correct of what I'm going to talk about. So let me start with a little video that some of you may already know. Let me know if you can hear the audio. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Count how many times um, how can I count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball? Okay, we were supposed to be here already. Can I um, ask you how many of you, can I get a brief show of hands of how many of you already knew the video? Oh, that's quite a number of you. Um, well, for those, maybe there are still a few who didn't. Um, can you maybe tell me how many passes you saw in the video? So how many times were, was the ball passed, if there was anybody? I can't see everybody. Did everybody know? The video? Okay, everybody. 15? Okay, yeah, almost correct. So 16 passes. <laughs> but was there anything else uh, you noticed aside from that? You mean the, one... the monkey or gorilla thingy? Oh, you saw the gorilla? Okay, I guess everybody else. Um, did everybody else see a gorilla? Yes, nodding. Okay, well then let's see what, what else what else happened here. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. So I guess if I would ask again, um, how many of you saw the curtain changing and the player mo moving away, I can already people shaking their heads. And that's exactly the point that I, I, I want to take, well, in this case about education settings, that how limited and how selective our perception is and what role our expectations play in this. We usually perceive only a partial amount of information from our environment. Um, and then we process it and finally base our decisions on this incomplete information. And in particular, it is our expectations that direct our attention and to determine what we perceive and what we don't and even how we perceive or judge something. And this brings me close to what my talk is about. So um, the first part of my presentation, placebos and nocebos in education, might suggest that we might look at studies here investigating the effect of placebo pills in education settings. For example, to what extent such pills might have an impact on tax anxiety, but that's, that's not the focus of what I'm going to talk about. I'm also not going to talk about um, learning disorders and disabilities and how placebos might have an impact on those. Instead, what my talk is going to be about is about psychological mechanisms um, of biased perceptions and expectations of teachers and what effects teacher expectations might have on students. Now, you might wonder what such kind of a sort of social psychological topic um, might, might be a little bit surprising in this kind of forum. 
In fact, um, this talk is based on a chapter that um, myself and two um, of my students and postdocs um, wrote together in an edited volume, Placebo 2.0, Die Macht der Erwartung, edited by Ulrike Binge, Manfred Schledowski and Helga Kessler. This book shows, um, and I think it's nice um, also in the picture here, that placebos and ex expectation effects can occur in quite different areas also in education, as we point out in our chapter. And in order to understand the mechanisms of such placebo expectations effect, um, a closer look on how we perceive our environment and ourselves um, and how these expectations emerge is essential. So my field, my background is actually um, in educational psychological research, questions and learning and teaching contexts. So I usually don't do research on placebos, but I'm very interested and it's very relevant to me what role teacher and learner expectations play in the context of educational treatments. So at first sight, um, medicine education may have rather little in common. But there are some parallels between doctor-patient and student-teacher relationships. Well, there are at least two actors in a more or less intensive ongoing mutual interaction. Um, and there's one professional person usually that gives, let's call it a treatment, um, to a private person, let's call the other person a private person, in order to initiate development, a positive develop in the private person. For instance, regarding a recovery or regarding a positive learning process. In a medical um, setting, the treatments are, for instance, in the form of medicine and the form of talking and attention. In education settings, treatments are, for instance, in the form of learning materials, also attention, talking, also good or bad grades, for instance. And in both settings, the persons involved each come in with their own experiences, perceptions, expectations, goal, which they bring to the interactions and which influence their behavior. In Madison, um, biased conception or information about a treatment raises biased expectations that initiate a complex interplay of doctors and patients' expectations, feelings, and behavior as a result that as a result can even ease physical signs of disease which would be called the medical placebo effect. There's no specified or fixed placebo term in education. It's usually not even used in that context. Our understanding in the educational era is that um, it's also about biased conceptions of, or information about a student that raises teachers' expectations that then trigger in a similar way a complex intra and interpersonal interplay of expectations, beliefs, feelings, or behavior that as a result can then manipulate students' expectations, feelings, and behaviors. In summary, so in both fields, what they have in common is their biased conceptions and expectations that trigger this, as I already said, complex interplay of one's own and others' expectations, feelings, thoughts, behavior, and that result in an impact of the treatment that otherwise would not have occurred. So in my talk, I want to look from a sociocognitive perspective on how, on how biased expectations arise in teachers and what impact they can have on students. With this, we have now already covered the first point in my agenda. In order to understand the underlying mechanisms of expectancy effects in the next steps, I will introduce some key assumptions of social cognition, that is about how we perceive, process, and judge based on social information. And then I will talk in my third point about the evolution of an impact of teacher expectations. And I would like to end my talk with some conclusions of how you might apply some of what I said um, to work in the medical um, domain. So starting point, what is the starting point? Social cognition concerns cognitive processes of perception, processing, storage, and decision-making social situations. Let's take a closer look here. Um, what is illustrated here is the cognitive process of social information processing. Well, a similar model would also apply to other information processing, but let me focus on social information processing here. External means the social environment. Internal, that's the gray area, means our internal cognitive system. Numerous stimulus events 
in our social environment enter into our internal cognitive system through our senses. We hear, we smell, we see, and so on and so forth. And due to the limited cognitive capacities we have, we're not able to absorb and process all the information. Instead, we select and filter information. That's a need, we must do that. And as was, was, uh, hop, was visible from the input video that I showed you, stimuli gain attention when they are, for instance, personally relevant, relevant for one's own identity, when they are expected by us, like many of you already expected the gorilla and therefore um, what you saw corresponded with what you expected, or to the contrary, when they occur surprisingly, when they're inconsistent with our expectations. And finally, when they're salient, when they stand out in relation to the context. So then the information from our social environment enter our cognitive system in a highly filtered manner, and then they're encoded and transformed there into an internal representation. The mental representation is matched and linked to knowledge that we have already stored in long-term memory, which gives the stimulus a meaning. Um, they're stored in long-term memory in the form of schemas and scripts organized into categories that abstract from specific instances. And we use these schemas and scripts to quickly classify new information. For social um, knowledge, the preferred way of organizing it is in, in categories is to group information by person. For instance, Judith is attentive, hardworking, introverted. Hannah is loud, intelligent, tall, and so on and so forth. If classifying by person, by individual person is not possible, for instance, the person, because the person is unknown, we organize information by social groups, especially salient categories such as gender, hair color, clothing, or ethnicity. This categorization, of course, bears the risk of wrong judgments and decisions, but it saves cognitive resources. Let me continue this idea here for a little while. Um, if we look at um, social information processes, we find that it can take place top down, category guided, so where we can also use these scripts and schemata, or it can happen bottom up feature guided. A further differentiation of the social information processing is according to the degree of automation or processing depth, which is what I will focus on here. Which type of information processing takes place depends on the available cognitive capacities or other restrictions like lack of time, low motivation, and on the available information. If information is processed bottom up, um, which you can see here in the yellow arrows, um, um, if it's processed bottom up in a controlled and systematic manner, this happens consciously, purposefully, and voluntarily. Here, the information is evaluated meticulously, almost in a scientific manner. It requires immense cognitive capacities, time, effort, but it is also characterized by a high degree of accuracy. On the other side, if information is evaluated automatically and heuristically using top-down processes like schemas or scripts, this happens unintentionally and involuntarily. Um, it requires little cognitive capacity, it's quite effortless, and is usually also without awareness that we apply these categories, for instance. This happens especially in situations when little cognitive capacity is available or there's no possibility for systematic processing of social stimuli. Then these uh, incoming stimuli are processed in an automatic heuristic way. Disadvantages here are potentially inaccuracy and a high probability of incorrect judgments and decisions. So up to this point, um, I have pointed out several critical things that, or think several critical points that may have emerged when errors in the social cognition can occur. For starters, um, selective stimulus perception. In order to not overload our cognitive system, we select and filter a limited amount of information from a vast amount of information, which enter our internal cognitive system and is then further processed. The individual social reality is therefore distorted by this filtering processes. Secondly, incomplete information um, 
social cognition may sometimes be based on incomplete information. And our decisions and judgments can only be as good as the information on which they're based. However, in most cases, we do not have complete information. Um, and the only information we have is in inaccurate or incomplete. Third, um, both as a filter in perception and in the further processing of stimuli, previous experience, expectation, and prior knowledge play a central role. New information is always perceived and evaluated in the light of already accumulated knowledge and experiences. And finally, um, both reason and intuition underlie social cognition. I have identified automated information processing based on category guided top down processes as particularly susceptible to drawing erroneous inferences. Well, let us now take a look at how this is relevant to teacher expectations. Teachers have a challenging every day working life. It is a cognitive demanding work, a large of amount of incoming social information if you think about the classroom content. School environment has further conditions that can promote errors, for instance, um, due to lack of time. In an education context, as I will show, wrong decisions can lead to far reaching consequences. Let's first of all look at potential pitfalls in the evolution of teacher expectations. Against the background of what I presented so far, the question arises to what extent erroneous decisions resulting from cognitive biases play a role in grades, transitions, career, and educational reports. Are learning related factors really the only factors that determine school performance and success in the education system? Several research studies have shown that the same performance is evaluated differently by teachers depending on usually different, usually obvious characteristics, such as, for instance, socioeconomic background. For example, in a study um, by Bonefeld and Dickhäuser, they examined um, how grading is influenced by the presumed nationality of the students. The participants in the study were 203 pre-service teachers, um, and they received dictations um, either of a supposed German, Max, or a supposed Turkish author, Murat, and either of average or poor performance. So two factors, the name, Max Murat, and the performance, the number of errors that were actually in the dictation. And the teacher um, participants, the pre-service teachers, were asked to count the errors in the dictation and to give a grade. The results. Well, first of all, the good news is the participants counted the number of errors correctly. So they found the errors that were in the dictations. However, the bad news is they still gave different grades to the supposedly different author. In particular, there was a significant di difference between the grading of the participants who were presented with Max's dictation and the grading of the participant participants who were presented with Murat's dictation. Well, remember, it's the exact same text, so it's just the name that's different. In other words, if the participants expected the author of the dictation to be a student with a migration background, the same performance was graded worse than if the participants expected the author to be German. And this effect was even higher when the performance level was poor, so when there were lots of errors in the dictation. A possible explanation for the differences in grades could be the activation of stereotypes by the name. Stereotypes are socially shared generalized beliefs about the characteristics that are associated with the members of a social group. They determine our perception and processing of social information again. If a stereotype is activated by a trigger variable, for instance the name here, information that corresponds to the stereotype is more likely to be perceived than information that does not correspond to the stereotype. For instance, in a German dictation of a student with a Turkish name, errors might be sort of the, the, the stereotype might be triggered that they carry more weight than in a dictation of a student with a German name. There's a confirmation bias, which leads to further reproduction of the stereotype and systematic disadvantaging um, treatment of the individuals. So that's actually quite problematic. 
Furthermore, if the stereotypes are activated, incoming information about an individual is not systematically processed and analyzed, but um, it is automatically distorted um, to fit the stereotype. In summary, just like all of us teachers sometimes unconsciously um, may make social information, um, may take social information and process it in a, um, a simplified way, as I pointed out about social cognition earlier. Accordingly, they may draw wrong inferences and develop wrong expectations towards students on this information bias, which might lead to unwarranted grading and may have even more profound effects on learners. Um, let me focus on possible effects of biased um, teacher expectations a little further. Here, I want to tell you a little bit about the seminal research by Rosenthal and colleagues that many of you are probably already aware, aware about. They provide an impressive demonstration of the power expectations can have in this particular context. The first of the experiments um, here was with rats, actually. So 60 rats were randomly assigned to 12 student participants. And these student participants were asked to train their assigned rats over five days to find food in a maze as quickly as possible. The 12 study participants were randomly assigned to experimental and control condition. And in the, the experiment, the um, students in the green condition here, in the experimental condition, were told your rats are particularly bright and they were bred for good maze performance. On the other hand, the participants in the control condition here in the gray control condition were told your rats are particularly dull and were bred for poor maze performance. Well, in fact, all the rats belong to the same breed. After five days of training the rats, the rats in the experimental condition indeed then outperformed the rats in the control condition. Although in fact, there were no differences to start with between the rats. These stunning results led Rosenthal and colleagues to conduct a similar experiment in a school context. I would expect that such an experiment would, of course, not be possible anymore nowadays um, based on sort of ethical considerations. But at the time, that was still possible. In this um, second experiment, 230 students, it was actually six classes of different grades, and that will be important later, completed an intelligence test. The teachers um, received misinformation that the test was an innovative method to identify children with an exceptional intellectual potential. Out of the students, um, 46 students were randomly selected for whom a particular positive mental development had supposedly been predicted for the from the test. So the misinformation was given to the teachers that for these randomly selected 46 students, the test would have predicted exceptional mental development. Then after nine months, all the students completed the test again. And now in fact, significant differences were found between the students in the control group about whom no information had been given to the teachers and the students in the experimental condition for which the teachers had been made to believe that they had exceptional mental potential. But this effect, and you see this in the red, red thir circle and in the, in the second grade next to it, um, also this effect was, was only found among the younger students. I will come back to this question um, in a moment, but before this, let's take a look at what lies behind the so-called Rosenthal effect that you have probably heard about before. So what happens here? Based on his or her expectations towards a student, a teacher behaves towards that student in a certain way. The teacher creates learning conditions that are more or less beneficial for students um, according to their expectations. For instance, in terms of the type of frequency of contact, attention, the time they give them to answer a question, or other opportunities to express oneself in the classroom interaction or the social emotional climate, for instance, the nonverbal communication, eye contact, smiling, physical proximity, but also in terms of feedback and evaluation, recognition in the case of success, um, or sort of the severity of negative assessments. 
Well, then let's assume the student behave, the student shows some behavior that is consistent with the teacher's expectations, which is not unlikely. I mean, then th what is started here is an ongoing conditioning process where the student's behavior through conditioning is further refined and more and more unconsciously adjusted to the expectation of the teacher. Um, then depending on the student characteristics, he or she internalizes the expectations placed on him. And I will come back to this in a moment. Um, and in this case, it manifests itself in the student's learning performance, which in turn confirms the teacher in his or her expectations. Whoops, now I had the animations wrong. So basically it's quite a, you could almost say vicious circle, a self-fulfilling prophecy circle. Well, let's come back or let's come to the potential effects on students here. Um, similar to the medical placebo effects, expectancy effects such as the Rosenthal effect um, do not become apparent in the same way in all students, as we already saw in this uh, results slide. Jacobson and Rosenthal, as I told you, detected the effect in their experiment only in younger students. A possible explanation here might be that the younger students still have a more fragile self-concept and um, a low self-efficacy expectancy. A self-concept is a persistent theory about one's own person. This is who I am. Um, well, on the other hand, the self-efficacy, and you can see there's um, some overlap between the two, um, uh, are self-related expectations of being, to able, of being able to master a certain task. Like, I can do that. The self-concept and self-efficacy expectations are shaped by the expectations that we get of others, teachers and other people. For example, a teacher's low expectation of a student's mathematical abilities can substantially and persistently shape the student's mathematical self-concept. Teachers can also have a major impact on students' self-efficacy expectations. This can far, have far-reaching consequences as the two loops here show. Well, let's look at the first loop here on the left in green, um, the development effects of high self-efficacy. In addition to positive experiences and role models, positive expectations of others have a positive effect on students' beliefs about their own abilities. This leads to learners setting challenging but realistic goals for themselves, attributing failures more to external circumstances and bringing a special willingness to exert effort and perform well, performing well accordingly. On the other side, besides negative experiences and no or failed role models, negative expectations of others like teachers have a negative effect on students' beliefs about their own abilities. This leads to learners setting no or unrealistic goals for themselves, attributing failures to their own incompetence, leading to a consistently low effort readiness and resulting in poor performance. In other words, what is really dramatic here is that the power of teacher expectations cannot just have um, sort of a limited effect on, on possibly unjustified grading but can have a lasting impact on students' um, self, selves and expectations. So this brings me um, to the conclusions. To sum up, what did I try to talk about here? In particular, um, we looked at how teacher expectations develop and what influence they may have on students' performance and self-beliefs. Like all humans, teachers base their judgments and decisions often on incomplete information, all kinds of information, as you can see here, that they may have on a student. And they unconsciously use mental categories, shortcuts to vo avoid overloading their cognitive system and conserve resources in the stressful environment of a classroom. Then based on this, the teachers develop expectations towards students that lead them to behave in accordance with the expectations towards individual students. 
In other words, they create learning conditions that are more beneficial for some students and less beneficial for other students based on their expectations. In terms of grouping, ways of asking questions, and so on and so forth, as you can see here in the figure. In particular, when students self-concept and self-efficacy expectations are fragile, they can be significantly shaped by teacher expectations and behavior, which in turn may influence their entire educational trajectory. So what about this is or may be relevant um, to you? Well, just as in schools, expectations, attitudes, and beliefs play a central role in all interpersonal relationships. The key assumptions of social cognition also apply to doctor-patient relationships. Keeping these in mind, keeping these in mind, negative developments in the doctor-patient interaction could be recognized and prevented, perhaps, or positive developments in the actor in the interaction can be initiated. I think that the following implications could be drawn for working with patients based on what I presented today. That it is worthwhile reflecting on own and patients' expectations and their impact whenever possibly, whenever possible, and doing this explicitly. So making expectations explicit. To self-critically review diagnosis and corresponding treatments for cognitive biases. And on the, on the other side, on the positive side, using positive, realistic self-healing powers of the patient and trying to enhance it by, for instance, reporting on positive cases. So basically using this expectation effect in a positive manner. I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to also acknowledge my student, Maiko Sinski, and thank her very much for her support um, with preparing um, this presentation.